This is a recording of the book discussion of Parable of the Sower with Dr. Kristen Lovis and Dr. Kendra R. Parker, facilitated by Lenisha Massenberg. This was a collaboration of Sklo Center Region Library and the Black Graduate Student Association of Penn State. Funding for the event is provided by the Pennsylvania Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we've brought in two facilitators to walk us through this event, and I'll give you um, a quick logistic of how this event's going to work, and then I will briefly mention the facilitators, and then we could just jump right in. So the logistics of this event, we're going to have five minute discussions for each of our facilitator, and then 15 minutes for audience questions. So during this time for our Q&A, feel free to raise your virtual hand and I will answer, I will press on your uh, unmute button so you can say your question, or if you'd like, you can put it in chat if it's easier. And then we're gonna go back into five minutes for each facilitator and then close this event with audience discussion until we have run out of time. And so our facilitators for this event are Dr. Kendra R. Parker and Dr. Kristen Lilvis. And so I would like to turn it over to our first facilitator for our theme. And again, if I, oops, I forgot to mention, pretty much each facilitator is gonna present on a theme and then talk about it. And that'll be good a good platform to ask questions on or ask other questions if we didn't get a chance to cover something. So our first theme is African-American literacy tradition, slave slash neo-slave narratives by Dr. Parker. So if you wanna introduce yourself and I'll pass it on to you, Dr. Parker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Dr. Parker and I teach at Georgia Southern University. And I love Octavia E. Butler. So when I received the invitation to uh, participate in this, it was an enthusiastic yes, and I'm super excited to talk about it. And so um, Parable of the Sower participates in the African-American literary tradition of narratives about emancipation. And the terms vary from neo-slave, emancipatory, freedom narratives. Um, scholars make use of multiple terms to talk about the novel, but chiefly the novel is on some level concerned with bondage and freedom. And so while the novel does offer us a fictional-ish dystopia that's um, it's, it's oriented more towards the future and the past, there are some clear and direct allusions to 19th century chattel enslavement. And so one of them, you know, Lauren mentions, we become the modern underground railroad, right? That's one of the clear ones. There's another where there's this conversation about debt slaves. There are several references to slavery throughout mm -hmm. Um, there's this belief that if we can convince ex-enslaved people to have freedom, no one's going to fight harder to keep it. And then there's even Grayson Moira's um, distrust of Harry because he's a white man. So all of these things. And so um, when thinking about that, it's really interesting because throughout the novel, there's this tension between folks who say things like this world is changing too much, too fast, and others who remark we've slipped back 200 years, indicating that not much has changed at all. And that's one of the interesting things about the neo-slave narrative as a genre is that it allows us to interrogate the past and the present and then possibly the future. And so, of course, if we think about slave narratives or emancipatory narratives, you know, their one of their purposes and one of their function happens to be, you know, how are we going to end uh, enslavement, right? And so the question then becomes: if we read Parable of the Sower as a neo-slave narrative, what is Butler trying to teach us? But beyond those particular connections to 19th century enslavement, one of the things I always enjoy pointing out to my students is thinking through Lauren's disguise as a man in the context of Ellen Craft. Um, and so I'll just give a brief background in case you don't know who Ellen Craft is. Uh, there's a husband and wife duo, Ellen and um, William Craft. They are two formerly enslaved Black people who escaped from a Macon, Georgia plantation in 1845. But to do so, Ellen, who was very, very fair skinned, um, had to pass as a disabled white man. And so Thinking about Ellen in that context with Lauren, for both of them, the adoption of a masculine persona was about access, especially for Ellen, but access to certain spaces, but it was also about safety. And I mentioned that Ellen passed as a disabled white man because she couldn't read or write. And so she faked an injury, she bound her hand, right? Her right hand, if I'm not, her right hand. And she also had to bind her face 
so that if a white person approached her, she could feign injury to she couldn't speak or she wouldn't have anything to say. And so her husband just passed as her manservant because they knew it was gonna be way too dangerous for the two of them to pretend like she was a, a free white woman with this black man traveling with her that just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked out very well. And so I mentioned that disability because Lauren has this impairment, her hyper, her hyper empathy. And these are, it's really interesting that Ellen adopts a disability or a physical impairment, whereas Lauren tries to hide hers, but they both operate as a man or operator or, or operator go through their worlds as men as a way to preserve their safety. And so essentially between uh, the deliberate intentional language of enslavement that's used in this novel, as well as the homage that I think Butler might be paying to Ellen Craft are just some of the ways that Parable of the Sower participates in the neo-slave narrative tradition of African-American literature. All right, thank you so much. So we're going to jump over to our next facilitator for our next theme. And again, this is a good time to be thinking about questions and comments. So our next theme is Afrofuturism with Dr. Lilvis. Thanks, I'm excited to be here. I'm Dr. Lilvis, Kristen Lilvis. I teach at Marshall University in West Virginia. And uh, like Dr. Parker, I am just obsessed with Octavia Butler and She's she is a great teacher, as Lauren says. We have to you know learn from everybody, and she is she is the best teacher. Um, when I think about this book, I I'm excited to build off of what Dr. Parker said because if we think about it in terms of the genre of Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism, and this is according to one of the people who talks about it a lot, Yatasha Womack, we see it as a genre that's blurring boundaries. So it's taking us to the past, so looking at historical fiction, uh, neo-slave narratives, references to chattel slavery, but it's also often taking us forward into the future, so we get things like science fiction and fantasy elements. And a lot of times when we think about Afrofuturism, we might be familiar with people like Janelle Monet um, or maybe Sun Ra, um, and so a lot of times we think about it in terms of technology, but it doesn't have to just be that. So Butler is really playing with Afrofuturism and drawing on the genre because she's blurring these boundaries in time and she's doing it to help us think about how this future that she's predicting tells us something about the present. So Kojo Eshin, um, an Afrofuturist theorist, talks about the future being a much better guide to the present than the past. And if he talks about this in terms of if we think about why people make decisions in the, in the present, it's not always because of this history of, of decision-making, it's because what we think is gonna happen in the future and we shape the present in order to meet, meet that. And one of the things that he points out is who is making predictions about the future, right? Who is in power and who is saying what the future is going to be and why are they saying that? So he talks, for example, about futurism's predicted um, in Africa and talking about economics and how that shapes real world present policy about trade, for example. And he's saying, but what Afrofuturist literature and art does is it reorients and rethinks about those futures and offers alternative futures so that we can also have alternative presence. And that's something that I think is really important about Afrofuturism. Even if it's predicting in the future, it's definitely telling us something about today and asking us to think about today. And that we get in the novel so much. Um, we get all of these predictions of what the future is going to be, because it is a novel set in the future. But even within that setting, we see predictions. So we have, because people are saying the future is going to be like the past, like Dr. Parker said, right? People are saying they're wanting a future where they get back to some good old days. And so because they're trying to get to a future that's like the past, they're like, I just need to kind of be static. We see people just kind of waiting for a more promising time to arrive. And this is even Lauren's dad that we see having some of these thoughts. But Lauren, as an Afrofuturist, is reframing that future. She's saying we need a future that isn't like a past. It's going to be different. She's interested in going and seeding her philosophy among the stars. 
And so because she's trying to get a different type of future, her actions in the present have to be different too. So she's not just sitting by and saying, we'll, we'll arrive there. She's building a philosophy that is focused on action and change. So that's why we see with Earthseed all of this talk about God is change, God is pliable. Lauren's imagining a different type of future and trying to work toward that. And so that's what I really like about the book, even though it's set in the future, it really is a book about Lauren's present and it's a book about our present. So if, if Butler is giving us this type of future, what is she suggesting that we need to do or not do to avoid some of what we see in the book? Thank you so much. And so now, this time we have 15 minutes open for audience questions. And feel free to send those questions to me via chat or you can raise your virtual hand. During that time, I completely forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> so you're going to be sending your questions to Lanisha. This, <laughs> I am a fourth year PhD student in biochemistry, microbiology, and molecular biology here at Penn State University. And I'm also the um, Community Service Committee co-chair for Black Rabbit Student Association. So, oh yes, I see one hand up. Let's see if I unmute you. Yes, you're you unmute. did. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I'm uh, Dr. Kendra Parker. I um, enjoyed what you were saying about um, the historical figure. Um, and there, there being um, a woman passing as a man, um, but there was also a piece of it that she was light skinned and uh, could serve uh, as an authority figure in some way with her man servant is what I heard you say. And that reminded me a lot of um, Octavia Butler's book, Kindred, in that um, it's the opposite, it's a white man passing with an African-American woman um, for safety reasons for the woman again. But still, I just wonder if, if, if you see that same kind of thing or, or if that um, off base or, thank you. No, thank you, uh, Carol Lee. Did I pronounce that yeah. right? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, no, thank you. Um, Kindred is very interesting, especially in terms of the neo-slave narrative genre. So. Um, Kevin, you're talking about Dana Franklin's husband, Kevin, and yes, he absolutely functions as the safety net for her when she, so if you've never read Kindred, I'm going to spoil some of it for you, sorry. Um, a 20th century woman named Dana Franklin somehow gets transported back into the 19th century slave past, and she travels back in time six times, and each time she goes back, she meets an ancestor of hers, the same ancestor, and this ancestor is a little bit older each time, and she realizes that she gets transported back into the past because he's in danger of dying. And so she has to keep him alive. So one of her ancestors in the past can live so she, so she can presumably live in the present. So when she travels back in time, she doesn't know what's happening. She's there and she doesn't stay very long. She transports back to the present and her husband is there and he doesn't believe her. And so when she goes back into the past that second time, her husband goes with her. And this is where um, the idea of the slave narrative becomes really important because um, when, when Kevin gets back in the past with her, he was like, oh my God, it's real. And that part is very important because it functions as a moment of authentication in the text. And with uh, 19th century slave narratives, there was always white prefatory material in the beginning. So um, William Lloyd Garrison um, authenticates Frederick Douglass's narrative. Uh, Lydia Maria Child does that for Harriet Jacobs because people, white people reading that text wouldn't believe that what happened in, 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 the, in the narrative was true unless a white person validated or authenticated that experience. And so that in many ways is what Dana's husband, Kevin does. Now, in terms of Parable of the Sower, um, we don't get that as much. I think what helps is Harry. You know, Harry has a problem using the masculine pronouns with Lauren, and it gets Lauren in trouble. She's like, you have to stop doing that. You have to stop doing that. Lauren can be a masculine name, L-O-R-E-N. And so Harry functions as that 
if the two of them are standing together because she's got short hair, because she's tall like her dad, she's built like her dad, you know, she can present as masculine, but Harry really has to do um, the work of, I guess, helping to authenticate that experience. Um, and I don't know if he does that very well, but that's how I see those two connecting in terms of uh, Dana's husband, Kevin, being an authenticator of, of Dana's experiences in, in a similar or different way in Parable of the Sower. Hope that makes sense. That's fabulous. Thank you for all of that information that I didn't have before. And that really, that really um, makes the books even more enjoyable. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. We are still open for any, oh yes. There's one question. Hi, my name is Leticia. Um, and this book was just amazing to me. Um, I, I haven't read a book like this, like a science fiction written by a black woman, just with all of these different intersectionalities put together in one. And so um, one point, like it was just, it was really interesting to know like this book was written, I think in the 1990s, but it was staged in 2024, 2027. But we are now in 2021 and it just all feels like it was a mer it is a merge of time and that there are so many similarities to now back then and what the future she had created in this book. And one of the moments in the book that really just struck me is when um, Lauren was talking about being a share and how when she was younger, um, I think like somehow she, she got into a fight with another student and she hurt the student to prevent any student from trying to hurt her because nobody knew that she was a share. And she makes a comment saying, you know, um, I think that my father beat me just to appease the other parents and not because like he really should have given her a whooping for the situation. And it made me think about a conversation that I had with my grandmother when um, she was telling me a story about one of her friends who had gotten into a situation with a white girl. This was back in, I think like the 1930s. And, um, you know, she was telling me the story and she was like, well, yeah, the, the dad, so the, the white men wanted to beat the little black girl because of whatever altercation that the black girl had gotten in with their white daughter. And the father was like, no, I'll do it. Let me beat her. And my grandma was like, and the reason he did that was because he did not want them to hurt her, his daughter, because if they beat her, they might kill her. Whereas when he was beating her, he knew that he wasn't going to hurt her further. And so it was like that can't, same theme of I'm doing this to appease someone else not necessarily because this is what I feel like is a justified action. So to see it written in that book, like that parallel, it was just, I was just like, wow. That was all of my comments. Thank you. Does anybody have, yeah, I definitely resonated with that too, just thinking on how, yeah, a lot of the way I was raised was, and this just kind of goes into line with um, maybe making sure I fit in and making sure everything is in line. This is kind of going on where Lauren was being a participant of her father's religion um, but she never really identified with it. And that was really strong on my family where a lot of us go to church, but it was just out of tradition and we did it, but it wasn't, maybe some people didn't necessarily go as a passion, but it was just something that you did because we all had to sort of fall in line. Um, and her passion for Earthseed was um, almost like pretty much what I would anticipate if someone were to be in church or something like that and I was just like wow that's really interesting to for her to have that passion and not necessarily share it with her father she was too scared 
she would just rather fall in line and she never told her father as she was interested about she never told her father about earth seed at um and that's really interesting that that's something that I find in my family where yeah it's just we would rather just fit in and not necessarily say like hey my interest is in something else um, so yeah that was my observation with that too hello Yes, my name is Colleen Krupka, and I really enjoy the panelists and their discussion because it's, I love the book, but I think the spin that you've put on it on the explanation that you put on it um, is made me appreciate the book even more. Um, my question was with her empathy. And when she, when they were talking about her religion and how a religion has to be mystical or people are not going to follow it, and I don't know if Butler was gonna trying to foreshadow what you could expect because of her empathy. And when she said, how many times did you die? You know, like I died four times. And it's like, you could imagine how her earth seed um, religion is going to expand later on in the future. And I don't know if you want to say or add anything to that. That's what I was getting from that. Um, I think your question actually builds on something Lanisha was saying that's really interesting. Um, she doesn't believe in the same, she doesn't have the same religious beliefs as her father growing up, but one thing that she does seem to learn from him is that she wants people to question her, right? Her father didn't really like when she questioned some of his beliefs. He gave her kind of answers like, you'll, you'll maybe understand later, or he did give her valuable advice that not everybody is motivated by the same factors that you're motivated by, which she really does take to heart. But something that we then see her also adopting is that other people question her about Earthseed. And she learns from those questions and she develops Earthseed more from those questions. And so I think that ties into her hyper empathy too, because she really does feel what other people feel. She literally experiences their pain and their pleasure. That fits into her philosophy and her religious beliefs as well. And so she changes those things, just as she says you can change God, she changes earth seed to really fit and be something that works with the community. She sticks to her beliefs, but it is always flexible because that's the, really the core of it. Yep, so we have Daniel next. Oops. Oops. Yeah, we're good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much for your for uh, being here tonight in the discussion. It's uh, I really appreciate it. The one of the things that I'm trying to formulate my question, so this might be a little um, all over the place at the beginning, but, um, you know, your discussion on Afrofuturism, you know, towards the beginning is, you know, in, in the middle of the book, you know, there was um, the one earth seed, I don't have it off the top of my memory, but it's basically, you know, embrace diversity or, or, you're, or you're just out of, almost out of necessity, it seems like, to survive. Um, and then towards the end of the book, um, it was almost, it, it kind of changed a little bit in my, like the way I was reading it, because when they had the discussion about, are you going to be coming with us? You know, they had a choice then, you know, to make the decision in terms of embracing each other's differences and trying to survive together as a community going forward. Um, so I guess like where my question will be coming is when it's almost like they tried to will diversity and embracing diversity into its existence within their group, you know, and then when we watch um, you know, what's going on in our government today and, um, you know, you're, there's calls for unity and, and then, then, you know, unifying with what, you know, when we have white supremacists running into the Capitol, you know, to destroy, you know, to take over the government. So I, I guess my question ultimately comes down is, you know, how much, you know, and then what Octavia Butler, I'm not sure if she would, have, you know, have talked about this or thought about this, but like in terms of how much from your, your past, you know, do you inherit into this to try and will what you want to your future? You know, I'm not sure what my question is, or more, maybe it's more of a comment, but, um, you know, if we're, if, if the goal is to embrace diversity, you know, not necessarily out of necessity, but just based on the fact that, 
you know, it's, it's, it's what we need for America to, to go forward and survive, you know, at, at, yeah, how do you blend the, the history from the present to the future? Does that even make sense? I'm not sure. I'm kind of rambling here. <laughs> Um, Parker, yeah, go ahead. Okay, no, I was just gonna say, no, I think it makes sense. Um, I will say it is a theme across Butler's works, this idea of embracing diversity, and it's not always clear cut. For instance, in her Xenogenesis trilogy, you know, you've got this non-human species who merges with humans and they they do things that are that that are good on the one hand, right? They they cure cancer and you know they take away illness and they lengthen your life but then you know you also can't have human children right um you know someone is impregnated without her consent but they say but i knew you wanted to be pregnant and you would never ask me and so there are all these questions about multiculturalism and what it and so their colonization there are all these these questions and one of the things that butler was sure about is that you we needed to create community and that you should create community with that was multiracial, multicultural and diverse, even if you didn't much like each other. Um, and I think we really see that with Parable of the Sower. So, you know, not everyone likes each other, but they, they, they work together out of necessity. And then, you know, she makes some really good points, she being Lauren, that, you know, sometimes the, the whiteness of some of the people in the group really helps them as they go into certain places, the presence of children, puts other people at ease with them. And this is really how we see that community should be multicultural and multi-generational for it to be really effective. Um, and so I think, you know, diversity for, for Butler goes beyond just racial and ethnic diversity, but in terms of age, class, um, sexuality, gender, and stuff like that. All right, we have time for one more question and then we're gonna shift back into themes. Dr. Lil, this was gonna say something. Oh, you know, I'd rather hear from the audience because I'll get into it with with my theme too. Thanks, though. Okay, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, let's see. Okay, all right. So it's Carol Lee. Yeah, thank you again. So I don't remember if it's in Parable of the Sower or Parable of the Talent. Sometimes they run together for me since um, they're a series, but um, the somebody earlier was talking about how um, very close to our current time some of the events are, right? And, I, and I'm not even sure if I remember this correctly um, because I, I was um, recently listening to it again and I was shoveling snow. So maybe I was a little distracted, um, but <clears throat> I think the president um, in this story at one point is running for office and says to make America great again. Am, am I misremembering it? I remember just like stopping dead in my tracks and saying that that is too predictive. There's no way she could have known that that would be a theme. And in fact, there's a lot of parallels to, were for me anyway, in that president. Um, lots of things that were different as well. But I would you comment on that? Because I, I ha think sometimes that I just wanted to think that's the way it was, but yeah. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, that is the presidential slogan in the in Parable of the Talents is where it really comes in. Um, and actually it fits really well to think about that in terms of Afrofuturism, because yes, we see that as part of the future that Butler um, could not have predicted, but it's also a tie to history. So Ronald Reagan used Make America Great Again as a slogan or a slight version of that. And so here we really see in this book, this complete moment of the past in our present, which was Butler's future coming together. And absolutely, it goes back to this philosophy of change and making America great again, as she's criticizing in the book, because Lauren does, you know, criticize this, is this idea of returning to a past that who is this past empowering for, who is arguing that this past is empowering when it's really disenfranchising how many people because of race, gender, sexuality, class, et cetera. And so, yeah, absolutely. She's drawing on this history that does relate to Reagan, but she's also predicting our future and showing, you know, did we learn 
from hearing some of these slogans in the past, we see that it just was repeated. So yeah, it's a great question. Thank you so much. So now I'm actually gonna pass it back to Dr. Lilvis to talk about the theme of inclusion and exclusion, as well as the other topic that you wanted to mention. Yes, yeah, some of the comments um, brought this out already a little bit, but one of the things that we see with inclusion and exclusion, just like Dr. Parker was saying that um, diversity is really the hallmark of what Butler talks about. She's also really focused on that in terms of hierarchies. So there's so many isms in this book. We see racism certainly um, with the discussion of worries about interracial couples traveling. We see the return of chattel slavery and indentured servitude talked about with some frequency. We also see a lot of classism. So those who are living in poverty are talked about in really derogatory terms. We see her using the term street poor. Sometimes those who are living in poverty are equated with other people who might be stealing or hurting others, even if that's not actually what those individuals are doing. But we see terms like predators, animals, maggots being used. And then individuals who have a substance uh, reliance on pyro, and even her mother who had a substance use disorder, are talked about in really stigmatizing language. Um, and so these are things that we see this book is really dealing with hierarchies. And Butler said in many interviews, she talks about it in relation to almost all of her work. She says hierarchical behavior can lead to racism, sexism, ethnocentrism, classism, and basically all the other isms that cause so much suffering in the world. And so what we have happening in the novel in a really interesting way is that she's working against that or suggesting that we need to be working against that through a couple of different things. One is through hyper empathy, of course. So because Lauren actually physically experiences what others do, she's suggesting that we can't quite have a hierarchical system because Lauren, even if she's stigmatizing other people, she still experiences what they're experiencing. And there's a, some level of equalness that comes out of that. But it's not even just through hyper empathy. We see the reje rejection of hierarchies play out in a couple of different ways in the book. Um, and it really does go back to the, what I mentioned earlier, Lauren saying that we have to learn from everybody and everybody being a teacher. So when she's outside of her community walls, even again, those people that she may have stigmatized, such as the people with substance use disorders, she makes them her teachers too. She learns from them and learns how to survive. Um, we also see even within her group at times, for example, when she first introduces Zara, she talks about her as Richard Moss's youngest and prettiest wife, which is not necessarily an issue, but she doesn't give her a lot of power the first time she introduces her. But then later, Zara probably is one of her biggest teachers. She helps her understand how to live outside of the community's walls, but it's not just about survival. She also really focuses on interpersonal relationships. And we get this one great moment in the book where um, Lauren and Grace and Mora are having a conflict and Zara diffuses it by sending Grayson's child over with some fruit. I mean, she's an expert. And so Lauren learns so much from her. And so I think it's just another example of Butler really working to cut down on hierarchies. And so that even if we see focus on inclusion and exclusion in this book, which we certainly do, I mean, it's a book with literal community walls. Even with all of that present, she's really working against it and cautioning us about that type of behavior. Thank you so much. And now we're going to discuss the theme of writing books and scripture with Dr. Parker. <laughs> That's a lot to tackle. I'm, I'm gonna do writing, but yes. Um, okay. So Parable of the Sower is an epistolary novel. So that essentially means it's a series of journal entries that are foregrounded by some of the earth seed verses. Um, and so, you know, Lauren is constantly writing the entire book is about this, but uh, there are some times when she calls attention to writing deliberately in the text. And when she does, writing has multiple meanings. So first we see writing as a sort of freedom, right? Um, she's, when she's talking to Joanne, uh, one of the things she says, she says, I felt on the verge of talking about 
uh, talking to her about some things I hadn't talked about before. I'd written about them. Sometimes I write to keep from going crazy. There's a world of things I don't feel free to talk about to anyone. And so for her, you know, writing is a form of expression. It's a, it's a way that she can find freedom to, you know, let some of her thoughts go. Writing is also a catalyst for change. Um, Lauren says that one day, you know, people are going to pay attention to me, but instead of focusing on how old I am, she says, I'll use these verses to pry them loose from the rotting past and maybe push them into saving themselves and building a future that makes sense. And so she wants to use writing. Writing isn't only freedom for her, but it's also something that she hopes to spur people to change and not just change, but to, to let go of the past, like Dr. Wilvis was saying, into this. She's an Afrofuturist, so she's visionary. She wants them to look towards the future so they can make a better present and future. Um, writing is also currency. She learns this from her brother, Keith. Um, you know, he's like, she's like, how are you doing that? He's like, because I can read and write. And um, later after he is killed, um, she says, you know, I wonder if there are people outside who pay me to do that. Um, and so she's like, Keith started me thinking about that. So, you know, writing is currency. And I think it's really interesting though that even though writing is currency, she's also well aware that both of her parents who have PhDs you know, aren't making a whole lot of money, which is true now, like today anyway, <laughs> but still like they're, they're not safe when they're going to work. Uh, but the idea for her that writing is still currency because there are people outside of her gated community who can't read and write, that's something that she thinks about. But I think the last one for me that's, uh, that's been weighing on me the most since I reread this was writing as comfort or compulsion. And so there are two times, or two specific instances in the novel, once on the 28th excuse me, the 18th of November in 2026, and then July 31st in 2027, where Lauren says, I have to write. So in 2026, she only says it once, but in the second instance in 2027, she repeats it three times in a matter of lines. Um, but what connects both of these moments is that right after she says, I need to write, it's directly followed by horrific violence, right? She's seen, she's seen dead bodies, she's seen dead bodies sexually violated. She's seen ash covered corpses and uh, bodies that had burned or half blown off flesh. But on top of that, she also discusses her inability to write, which then compels her to want to write more. So in August 2026, after her brother's body is found, uh, she says, I haven't been able to write a word since Wednesday. I don't know what to write. And then a few lines later, she says, I don't want to write about this, but I need to. Some, sometimes writing about a thing makes it easier to stand. And so writing as compulsion in all three of these instances for this last, for this last way that writing works in the text, um, she's writing to make sense of the world around her, which is in some ways much of what the novel does. But I think in those particular instances where she's like, I have to write, I can't write, but I need to write. It's because she's writing as a form of catharsis, as a form of release, uh, as a form of community with herself, right? There, she's got all these other communities that she's building, but there's a community with herself because she doesn't know what else to do. And for me, this writing as catharsis also functions to remind her to herself that she's living, right? That she's alive, that she's human, which is very interesting with the language that she uses to describe other people like Dr. Lewis has said as like maggots and predators, but she writes as a way to sort of maintain her humanity, even if she doesn't bestow that humanity to other people um, in the same ways. Thank you so much. And now we are open for the duration of our time for audience questions. And so again, you can raise your virtual hand and I will unmute you, or you can send your questions or comments in chat. Oh yes, let's see here. Hello everyone, good evening. Good evening. Um, I guess, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, so I'll just go ahead and talk. This is for Dr. Parker. Um, and so when you were talking about the character and Butler's kind of emphasis or portrayal of the power of the written word, I started thinking, and this could be my own policy rabbit hole. I'm in K through 12 education, so I'm often critiquing what our students are exposed to. And I started thinking about like the structure of curriculum. And so I'm English ed and we, put a lot of emphasis on teaching students how to read. The testings are, you know, they get tested, it's reading comprehension, but a lot of things are still very multiple choice or very short response. And I noticed that students are not really pushed to be strong writers. If anything, there's a fear of writing from students and teachers alike. 
So when I was listening to you, I thought about if there really is such power in the written word, is it intentionally structured that students are fearful of it? it you know, when you start thinking about it being able to make moves, um, to shift, to do all these things, really, if, if the written word almost is a currency, we think about the structure, structure of America and like our forefathers, it's like, I started thinking like, oh my gosh, hmm are we really almost avoiding and intentionally wanting to make sure only a very small percentage of the population is comfortable writing at a very high level? Um, it, it seems almost intentionally done even now what they're doing with SAT. And of course it's the conversation because of COVID pressures, but they're removing the essay for right now. So when you think about that higher order, the level of writing, it just started making me think. So I guess, Maybe your thoughts on that? Um, not necessarily a question, I'm not sure, but it just made me like, ooh, this, this is actually really deep. If writing really is currency, and I think about the way we cultivate our students to not truly be writers, or a very cookie cutter, that organic sense of writing that Butler is able to produce, we really aren't, in my opinion, cultivating students to be able to do that. That was just my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. No, absolutely. I and this actually ties back into the very beginning of the conversation. This idea for, of of literacy, read the power of reading and writing, uh, something that enslaved Black people were not allowed to do because it was a sort of it was currency in in in, in terms of they, you know, if I learn how to read and write, then hey, I can get access to freedom in multiple ways. Um, so yeah, now I'm, I do think that there is a fear. I do think that education is designed in a way that certain people are often disenfranchised in the education system when it comes to reading and writing. I think you see that, um, I, I don't know much about K through 12, <laughs> but you know, the books that are put on AP classrooms, right? So what are you, what are you learning in your 10th and 11th grade and 12th grade classrooms? What books are allowed to be there? You've got banned book lists in high school where Toni Morrison or uh, Janine capo uh here at Georgia Southern just a couple of years ago, like October 2019, there was a book burning on our campus because students did not think that Make Your Home Among Strangers um, should have been a, a required text for the fall. And so absolutely, I, you know, there's this saying that you can't be what you can't see. And so if we don't have writers of color, queer writers in the classroom, then it's no wonder that students don't want to read. And then it's no wonder that they don't want to write. If there's, you know, if there's power in representation and power in the written word, if you don't see yourself empowered in certain ways, you're not, you, you may not want to do that. Um, I think it's one of the fantastic things about Amanda Gorman um, being the, inaugura the inaugural poet and then being at the Super Bowl. I just had students just the other day, they were like, I'm all into Amanda Gorman right now. And that's, that's all they want to talk about. And I'm, I'm here for it. So I don't know if that fully answers your question. Um, but yes, I guess the short answer is yes. I do think that the education system is intentionally designed to disenfranchise certain people to prevent them from using language. And I'll, I'll say this one last thing. This is also why um, the, um, there's this thing called students' rights to their own language. Uh, I have to thank Dr. David F. Green at Howard University for bringing this to my attention, but he teaches at HBCUs and he's really uh, interested in transforming how we think about um, student language in terms of stand, like marking them for standardized grammar and allowing students to use their own language in the classroom when they write their essays. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So we have a question in chat. I'm going to read it. I'm really interested by the concept of the neo-slave narrative that Dr. Parker mentioned in the beginning. I remember learning from the late Dr. Hampton about the framework of the slave narrative at Howard University. So I see how the framework emerges throughout Butler's parable, but I'm curious about what makes it applicable as a slave narrative specifically. Also, what role does a neo-slave narrative slash its framework serve in modern times? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you Dr. Hampton, so I'm tearing up because uh, he was my, my graduate director at Howard. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, so um, 
parable participates in this tradition, depending on which scholar you read, they argue that it's a postmodern neo-slave narrative novel. I actually think that's what he calls it in his book. Um, and the idea of a neo-slave narrative is that there, there are a couple of different ways you can think about it. It's one that it's a novel that's literally set during the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a novel that's you know published in the 20th century or later that's set during enslavement, or it could be a novel that is you know set during you know, the, uh, the 20th century, but that deals heavily with the slave past. And so Parable of the Sower fits into the latter category, simply in that it, it links back to some of the themes in terms of historical context, but the push for literacy is one, right? So the, the, the act of writing, uh, the first person narration, or the, I mean, that's another trend or another comparison with the neo-slave or the slave narrative genre in that she, she is writing her own story, telling her own story. And I'm sorry, I'm looking at the rest of it. And so now the second part of the question, uh, what's the role does a neo-slave narrative and its framework serving in modern times? That's a good question. I think that's something that Butler would want us to think about. So in terms of Parable of the Sower, if you're thinking about the slave narrative as trying to champion people towards abolition, what is Parable of the Sower trying to get us to do? And I think it's a number of the things like uh, to think of ourselves as Afrofuturists, like Dr. Lilvis was saying the idea that we need to be future thinking, right? Looking to the past is fine, but if we can imagine a different future, how will that transform the way that we think? Um, she, uh, Dr. Lilvis cited Kodwa Eshun, who says that the future is a much better guide than the past. And so looking to the future, I think that's one of the things Butler's text does. The other one is, you know, the neo-slave narrative as it presents itself in Parable of the Sower, um, Butler is really telling us to prepare, I think, I, I mean, I, when I first read this novel in undergrad, I, I never finished reading it. I hated it. I was not interested. Um, and I didn't revisit it until uh, I was in grad school. And I, I don't know what I didn't like about it, but rereading it, it's horrific and it's horrible. But we're not that, I mean, we're not really that far off from it right now. You know, we're pretty, we're pretty much there. We're pretty much there. And so I think that this is a warning, like, you know, what are we, are we prepared to do what's necessary? Like if, if, I mean, if we keep going the way that we're going, this is going to be our future. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that it, it calls us to do to really stop, sit, think and reflect like, what can we do right now, right now, right now, not tomorrow. Like what can we do right now to affect the change that we need to make? Um, otherwise, you know, our future is gonna look precisely like this particular text. So thank you. All right, so we have Leticia. Hi again. So just one comment to Dr. Parker before I get to like what I actually raised my hand for. Um, I, when you were saying that we are not that far off from what this book is portraying, like I thought that probably within the first two like maybe probably the first chapter maybe within the two chapters I was like oh my gosh like just going back to what I said earlier with like the parallels and like this is 2024 I mean we're in 2021 right now can we got to get it together like so yeah that really um resonated with me and um was just something that was in my mind and just even the idea of like her having a ready pack like a, a pack for you know in the event that I need to run or in the event that I have, I'm waking up in the middle of the night and I just can't grab it, like, yeah. Um, but the um, point of me raising my hand was, uh, I really appreciate Dr. Lilvis and um, what, uh, like how she was bringing out the different isms that is represented within her group. I, I mean, I noticed that she was slowly building people based off of the things that they could bring to the group and the strength in numbers. And I even realized how um, she was so, um, what is the word? She was just so knowledgeable of the different traits of people. So I'm thinking about Benko and how she was like, he, he never told her that he was a doctor, but like, she was like, yeah, he, keeps his beard well groomed and she was just like he has an actual plan like he's not telling me everything and just 
but he was older, right? I think he was like maybe 57 or something like that. And then thinking about, um, so there was like the educated, the old, the young, the white, the black, the sharers, like there were other sharers in the group. Even like um, the two pros, were they prostitutes? The, or I don't know what they, what the correct, what, but the women who were forced into like sex work, I think. So like just th there was a number of different dynamics that was within the group from just so in the yeah so that I just really appreciate because it the aha the light bulb just went off when you were talking about all of that so thank you yeah thank you and one of the things that I like most about that is we do see her you know thinking about and, and judging people and, and trying to get a sense of what they can bring and so we do see you know times where maybe her judgment is correct. Like having, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, the Harry there. And the fact that Harry is white does actually afford them some opportunities. So some of those judgments pan out. But then we do see her slowly start to learn that she can't predict what everybody can bring. And so I think one of the good examples would be the children that they have joined. And she every time she's like other people in the group and even she's like, all right, this is going to be hard. We're going to look vulnerable, maybe. You know, is is this a risk to have these children with us? And then she slowly says, "Man, the best way for other people to sort of be friendly is that they see these children sometimes and they diffuse tension." And so, really learning that even some of those assumptions that she has, she learns things from people that she never really expected, and that brings strength to their community, which I think builds on what Dr. Parker was saying, that it's about embracing diversity in a variety of factors. Yeah, thank you so much. Is there anybody who has any questions? Feel free to ask. We have a few more minutes. Could I ask an unrelated question? Sure. I would I would love to hear a little bit about Dr. Parker's work on female vampires in America. Yes. I want to hear too. I'm interested. Because <laughs> I read um, Octavia E. Butler's Fledgling. So it was like, yeah. Oh, that's so flattering. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even know where to start. Um, but no, I, I guess essentially the project got started at Howard University because of Dr. Hampton. I took this whole class on Octavia Butler and I was re you know, reading most of her work. The only thing we didn't read in the class was uh, the parable series. And as I was reading, I was like, oh, there's the word vampire appears here, it appears here. And I was like, oh, there's this trope of vampirism that runs throughout her work. And so I wrote this final paper on vampirism, Reaganomics. Uh, and, you know, this idea that, you know, the vampire isn't really, you know, marginalized people, the, the predators are the white people in power. And so this whole thing, and that's where my work stemmed from. And so what I ended up doing was I looked at um, black, African American women writers here in the United States from 1977 to 2011. And I looked at how they constructed their black female vampires um, to bite back against some of the stereotypes Ooh. that were imposed on them, whether it was in terms of the Jezebel, the Mammy, the Sapphire, uh, the Welfare Queen, some of these particular stereotypes. And, you know, I found that sometimes the answers didn't necessarily seem to be as clear cut as I thought they were going to be, but it, it, was, it, was, a, it was a labor of love, if you will. It was nice to see Black women doing something different you know being represented as vampires and really taking charge you know they can they're they're predators so they're they're they do what vampires do but their reasoning and their motivations are different um yes they kill but they typically killed in self-defense or to preserve their community or if they were attacked um they would they did not necessarily take life if they could help it they would rather give it i'm not saying that it was consensual but at least they were giving something in return for their taking which is a quote from one of the characters um, in mind of my mind butler's novel and so it's the idea that there was a that something about them being black women vampires really 
shifted the way they shifted the way black women vampires were if that makes sense um <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> well, very very cool it looks at, i would love to read more about your work so thank you thank you Are there any more questions or comments? Feel free to ask. We have about four minutes left. Four. Yep, we have a few minutes. I just wanted to um, thank both ladies for just their thoughts, their expressions. I have a notebook like I'm in class. Um, so I've just enjoyed just listening. Um, I realize as a professional, just the time it takes to do something extra. And I appreciate you all um, really just sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Your, everybody's questions have been fantastic. I do have a question. <laughs> Dr. Lovitz, I do wanna know, um, what's your favorite Butler book or work? Um, I love butler short stories i think are my favorite i just think every one is like a perfect like contained gem um but also like a million lessons in them so i think blood child is probably what i've written on and talked about the most and i love working with it because my students are like what is this weird insect alien thing and I'm like right like <laughs> it's telling us so much about um about class and about enslavement and indentured servitude about family um about race it's just a million lessons and so I'm I, that's probably my favorite and then I'm also obsessed with uh Dawn I just love it yeah how about you mm, I knew you were gonna do it it I, I, I'll be honest, my answer is whichever book I'm reading at the moment, because um, it is it is an unfair question, but I like asking it anyway. And so I just got done teaching speech sounds in the evening, in the morning, and the night today. So it would have to be those two. <laughs> All right, so we have one minute left. Um, let's see. Okay, I don't see any more comments or questions. Um, everyone is welcome to unmute themselves. We only have about a minute left. But during that time, I wanted to say thank you all for, for participating in this discussion and reading Octavia Butler's work. I feel it is a great honor to just discuss and learn about Octavia Butler, who, wow, maybe she can predict the future, you know, just reading this book now, it was really relevant to pick up this book now. So thank you so much. And I wanted to thank the speakers, Dr. Kristen Lovis and Dr. Kendra Butler for their time, as well as the Slow Library for working with me and putting this event together. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. Oh yes, yeah, so someone has their hand raised. I also had one other comment. In addition to saying thank you, I really enjoyed the conversation and just this, uh, new understanding and thought process in terms of the book. Um, there is a conference, an Octavia E. Butler conference that is free this year. If anyone wants to, I think it's called like the Octavia E. Butler Literary Conference. Yep, I can put the link in the chat. Shameless plug, both Dr. Lilvis and I will be speaking at that conference. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Also, if you didn't know, there is a um, opera based on Parable and Toshi Regan, who's one of the creators of that opera will be there and performing. So it's a great opportunity for Parable in a new way. And the graphic adaptation to Parable of the Sower came out last year. Um, yeah. So it's, it's like Parable of the Sower in comic book form, but it's really, I'll just, it's beautiful. So I'm just going to step in there and say that li the Square Library has that okay. both on, on our shelves and at Hoopla. So you guys can 
reserve your copy today. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, when I was reading this book, it almost felt like it could be turned into a movie, you know. But it was incredible. I, you guys, yeah. you did such a great job. And I, we really, really thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. I mean, it just meant so much to us to see you guys and to hear your take on Octavia E. Butler. Thank you guys. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. We maybe have to do it again next year. Choose a different book. Oh, yes. Parable of the Child. <laughs> mm. No, we'll see. Venetia, you'll still be here, right? Yes, I'm actually interested in doing this again. Right. Um, yeah, I love reading books and I'm no expert to dig deep. So this has been fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm just in science, just looking at science papers all day. And I'm just like, you know what? I need to actually read something that I'll enjoy and just step away from science for a little bit. And this was just awesome. So this is great. It's very difficult when you're, when you're doing grad school to find time to read stuff that's not grad school stuff. <laughs> yeah. Usually really Manisha, what is, what is your field? Oh, I study uh, biochemistry. Uh -huh. Yeah. And yeah, usually reading is trying to troubleshoot something that didn't work. So it's, I enjoy right. reading the field, but it's just trying to get something to work. <laughs> so this is really refreshing where. Well, if you ever want to do a, a reading group with other scientists, let me know. Okay, definitely. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. We are going to, I think, stop recording now. Right, Ben? <laughs>